Score, the podcast. The only show taking you inside the studios of the world's most celebrated composers and musicians. Welcome back to another fabulous episode of Score, the podcast. We have a very special episode today. First of all, we're joined by our fearless leader, Matt Schrader, or Mash hey. Raider. Uh, <laughs> Kenny yes. couldn't join. Kenny is out conquering worlds today, but we have Matt How with could us. he not for this one? This was, I, know, I was so I, excited for this. I told him, dude, this would be... We're, we're so... <sighs> Kenny, we're disappointed in you. Cancel and, your uh, you, rumble. You're welcome back anytime, Kenny. but... <laughs> but it's a special episode because we have one of the true legends maestros and my personal real favorite uh among the top film composers james newton howard who as many of you know has scored enormously important films and is having as we're about to hear a pretty amazing month he has four projects three of them films actually it's one film two massive series and a solo album all coming out in these four weeks that we're talking about so we're going to talk a little bit with james today about pain hustlers huge series with emily blunt all the light you cannot see which is just a fantastic new netflix series the Hunger Games prequel mm, out this which, week, yeah, which is coming out, which is kind of massive, and then of course, just in his spare time, he made a solo album of the cues from his great opus of M Night Shyamalan movies, which includes. And I always wonder with those, like when someone comes goes back and yep. revisits things, what. Do you change? What are the little things that have irked you for years? And you thought, ah, if I had more time, I would have done that. And this well, is the I, opportunity. I've been listening to those cues now as big eight suites that he's created from the Sixth mm -hmm. Sense and Signs and The Village, all those real unbreakable. I always loved that score. So that's an incredible project. So I think it's time to bring our fabulous guest. We, first, I wanted to just mention this thing because this has been happening. This is such an unusual thing. Um, but Stephen Price posted oh, a yeah. video uh, of his uh, choir for this uh, Looney Tunes, Wiley Coyote. Coyote versus uh, Acme is was the planned name of this movie. Warner yep. Brothers uh, animated live action blend uh, of a movie. Stephen Price, who I this. must say, a former guest of Score the Podcast and an Academy uh -huh. Award winner for Gravity. That's Great right. And I, think, I think it's in that order on his bio, <laughs> his biography. <laughs> right. um, so Stephen Price, this is, is very unusual that a composer will post something before a project comes out. Uh, he did so because Warner Brothers decided to take to, to shelve this project now that it is virtually done. And uh, take a what what is estimated to be a thirty million dollar tax write off, basically on this project. And I wanted to get your thoughts, Robert, um, because you've dabbled in both of these worlds of of uh, of music, of course, but also kind of like the the executive decisions that happen that influence the art form. Because a lot of people, I mean, obviously, the director of this project was very upset. You know, I imagine. Uh, Stephen Price is not thrilled that all this work for what sounds like a really cool score, and who doesn't love that great kind of like Looney Tunes sound mm -hmm. too? And he's 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 bringing a cool new element to it. Um, but uh, but the, this whole new is this a new thing where a studio will just say, "Hey, we're not doing that after all. That's done. No one's ever going to see this. It's going into the vault." Um, I have a couple. First of all, I I may take issue with the word dabble because uh, I haven't just dabbled in that. It's been my entire career. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'm a dabbler. I'll, I'll go with that. Um, I may have an opinion on this that is dissonant, uh, may not be popular. So to answer the first question, are studios just doing this? It's not the first time that a studio mm -hmm. has dumped a film. I certainly... Uh, 
I even worked on a really cool movie that got dumped and then got kind of re-released by popular demand later uh, and is now a cult favorite. But um, I think my – it's Idiocracy. Oh, yeah. Idiocracy. Yeah, that's a it, big it wasn't favorite now. dumped, but it was really, nah, this isn't going to work and – not that big a loss and it's kind of weird and it wasn't promoted and Mike Judge was very unhappy as were the folks like myself who had worked on it because I thought it was just fabulous. I mean, any movie that has a character named Upgrade was kind of <laughs> just so cool. But um, so I think my dissonant point of view which is instead of being consonant. Um, last time I checked, they're paying for everything. I mean, there's this kind of, you know, moral outrage. My God, I wrote this. I worked on it. I This is my blood, sweat, and tears. How can you tank it, you mean studio? Well, those feelings aren't in any way discounted. Totally mm -hmm. legit. As someone who's... You know, as a recording artist, I made records that didn't come out. Actually, the re record label went out of business and the record wasn't released or they decided yeah. to kind of release it in name only, but they didn't. And I was out of my mind with unhappiness. But last time I checked, It's their business. It's their money. Yep. So for a studio to say, we're going to do this as outraged and, and offended as the artists are, in some ways you've just, that's the bargain. You're, you're not well, in control. And I think some of the frustration comes from, on the creative side, comes from the fact that the studio technically owns all of this, right? I mean, this oh, isn't. absolutely. I mean, technically Stephen Price couldn't, just use some of that not that he would but if he said hey this actually this looney tune sound would be great for this period piece that i'm about to score um he wouldn't be able to use Correct. any of that because the studio now owns the the work the the result of all of that creativity that he's put into it so it's it's really almost the business side of it of course does make sense the studio owns it but there is kind of like a huge shame to all this creative work from talented people, and we might never get to see it as a result of oh, this. I, and of I course, in this case, I now the the latest on this is that Warner Brothers is starting to shop this around because there's been a good amount of uh, of feedback. Uh, I blowback because. is more accurate. People there's been a said, lot of blowback, and so Warner Brothers now yeah. has said, "Okay, well, maybe we'll try to try to sell this to somebody." Um, I don't know if that will. Uh, reach the threshold that they were looking for as a tax write-off. I would imagine that's probably somewhere around what the math of it is, but um, probably going to be a huge hit because we all know that this amount of press, I mean, listen, <laughs> I worked on, uh, you know, Slumdog Millionaire was um, kind of discarded by its studio and picked up by Searchlight. Um, and uh, look what happened there. So, so studios make the wrong call. I think you've identified, Matt, something that's really a terrible part of this, which is you do all this work as an artist, Stephen Price and David Green and the people that worked on it, and then they own it and they walk away with it. And it's like, wait, I just spent two years of my life working on something. Uh, and I think it's got to be just devastating and hurtful and all that. But the hard part is that's their prerogative to do it because they paid for everything. People don't realize that movie studios yep. own every aspect of the movie for the simple reason that they need to be able to resell it, relicense it, stream it, package it, DVD it, launch it into outer space. So they need to own everything. So I once remember being told Tom Cruise in a movie we'd worked on uh, night and day. Well, you know, they own his entire performance. And I thought, that's so, what does that mean? Well, that's part of what an actor does. You give yep. that performance and the studio owns your performance. Um, and I think that's part of, in closing, that's part of the issue with what 
thankfully was just resolved, the SAG after strike was they own the performance with AI. How much can they take your performance and repurpose it? And mm -hmm. actors new and, right? Yeah, actors were saying uh, not. And I, you know, they've reached some agreement as to what mm -hmm. the limits are. But um, I feel yeah, badly it looks for like Steven. a, a three-year deal. So this may come up again in uh, in a pretty quick amount of time. Some of yep. these issues, if if uh, we keep seeing crazy advances in AI and everything, but um, but, but I think if you want to strike a blow for uh, the revolution, go to Coyote versus Acme every day all showings and make it a huge hit and then they will be able to i mean this is have to eat marketing this is worth some marketing you know yeah. the, the the press headlines from something like this people are going to hear about this as a result of this and yep i don't know now i'm thinking maybe i wouldn't have if this had just released in theaters but maybe now i would be uh i'd be interested in that looney Tunes i can't wait experience. i love it enjoy the full atmosphere of something like that. First of all, that, what a so. cool idea for a movie. Who doesn't love Wiley e. Coyote being, you know, chasing Roadrunner off the uh <laughs> blowing and blowing himself TNT. up and <laughs> right. crushed by boulders and <laughs> dynamite freezing in midair and oops. <laughs> yeah, exactly. freezing in midair. Anyhow, let's get all to right. James. James Newton Howard coming up next. And seating himself in the chair hey, currently, won't you welcome, please, James? It is such a pleasure to see you for many, many reasons. But as I was saying just before you came on, I've had a week once again of a James Newton Howard concert, and dude, it's it's hard not to fan out i must tell you well thank you it's been uh it's been like james howard james newton howard month a lot of stuff been going on yeah <clears throat> we are in the middle of i'd like to say welcome and say that it is james newton howard month because i've just gone through i mean i think in three weeks you have three massive releases and that's one thing I wanted to ask about, which is how in the world are you going from Night After Night, which is a great title, yep, uh, the M. Night Shyamalan brilliant and beautiful record of cues. You have my new favorite, All the Light You Cannot See. I've been, Mrs. Craft and I have been watching and stunned by. and. Hunger Games, and one more. Tell actually. me, do you? Sl there's a. I missed there's one. A movie called um, Pain Hustlers. <laughs> Emily <Right>. Blunt. <gasps> yep, that's right. So, Emily Blunt. Yeah, I did with Michael Michael Dean Parsons, who I think you've you were just talking to. Just met. Yeah. Very talented young composer, James. So what are can uh, I, first of all can, what what are yeah. times like so, this like just since we're on the topic when you have multiple things out at the same time I it was telling Robert it's always kind of funny when you see like some actor who has two huge Tom Hanks has two huge movies totally different genres or whatever at the same time and he's out promoting them or whatever it you know his whole life and you end up one of them usually ends up kind of falling underneath some of the others but um what is that like as a composer because you've poured your heart into all of these projects when they start to come out and they're so close together. Um, it's a moment of, I guess, uh, overwhelming gratitude for me that, wow, mm. I get to write all that music and I get paid for it um, and work with these great talented people. So um, the one thing, you know, my son is a um, senior editor at a, at a publishing company called Farrar, Strauss and Giroux. And he was just made a senior oh, editor beautiful. and there's articles about him in Harper's Bazaar, New York Magazine, as being a cultural, one of the new cultural, I guess, I, not icons, but influencers. And he's been very excited about that. Hmm. And I said to him, remember a Jimmy Webb song called MacArthur Park? And there's a line in there that goes, I will win the worship in their eyes and I will lose it. So right now I'm getting the hmm. worship and it'll 
inevitably go back down and flatten out, which is fine. Um, yeah, it's good. Though I wonder, I, in your career, I, I mean, as I'm going through all our old podcasts and reading about you, I think that, unless I'm mistaken, I don't see a dip in the decades of your output I, I you've always been top of the game you're, you're you know you're rafael nadal has there ever been you feel a period that it yeah i mean i guess it's one of those things where maybe you feel it but maybe the outsiders that know your music don't <laughs> don't see it quite as much do you think of your your work in chapters like that uh, you know i quite honestly i don't know how i think about my work it's just go been going on for almost huh. four decades and um yeah I think strategically, I have tried to, to do various kinds of projects whenever it was possible. So, you know, when I did Pretty Woman, I was the mm. rom-com guy. And then I did The Fugitive, I was the action guy. And, that, and that's what happens. And so if I just kept trying to pepper it all with um, different kinds of, of, of um, challenges, it would, it would be good and keep me very interested. So I just love composing for movies. And there, there was a year, I think, where I, there was a couple of years. I think the year, the first Batman Begins, I think just before that I had done, I think, The, the Interpreter. I think I'd worked with um, mm. Sydney, which is an amazing thing. And unfortunately, it goes perfectly. Uh, when I'm working for Sydney Pollock, I get writer's block. And I think I've had it twice in my oh, life. No. Um, but I managed to get through it and I, and then I think, did I do, I don't know. I thought I did a, a night movie shortly after that, but anyway, right in that period, it wasn't fun anymore. I was going through a, I think I was getting divorced on top of that. So it was just a hmm. difficult time. And I, I kind of decided to take a long breather, not because I thought it was healthy, but just cause I was so depressed. And that's when I got a call from Hans saying, hey, why don't we do this movie together, Batman Begins, and um, it's really a cool guy. And he had gotten the call, and he said, and he called me, and he had said to Chris, yeah, I'll do the movie as long as I can do it with my mate, James Newton Howard. And Chris said, yeah, cool. And so we both went over to London and spent six or seven weeks writing the score, and it was a blast. You know, I had fun again, and um, Hans really <laughs> taught me that. Um, that if it's not fun, hmm, why are you doing it, or how do you make it fun? So that was a period I think I was. Did you ever have a dinner with him, a night with him, a cup of tea where you confided that this was special, or you had previously to this moment bummed out a little, and this was great? Did you have that conversation, or was it organically just moving forward? You know, he and I are pretty close friends, and. He's heard me. We've both been present when one of the one or the other of us is going through a difficult time, um, and then it passes, and then you move on. But I think this was just one in a long line of of uh, you know immers uh, emotional kind of turbulence once in a while that just happens. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm amazed that it's one in a long line because you're you've chosen a career that involves a lot of emotional turbulence in some ways. You're not a roofer, you know, you're just going to show up and put the roof on and go home. I'm sure there's emotional turbulence there too, but you have to I mean, all the light you cannot see. I'm riveted by the story. I'm amazed by the emotional, there's a theme in there that's just, it's heartbreaking. So you got to get into emotional turbulence as a day job. So it's amazing you say it's only been one. Mm. James, I want to ask you about that solo album, because in the middle of doing so many different, you know, assignments, was that elective? You just decided that's something I want to do? Did Sony Records come to you and say, we'd like you to make a record? I'm just curious. I think the genesis of it perhaps was my agent, Sam Schwartz, talking with Mark Cavell, head of Sony Masterworks. Yeah. Um, 
and there was conversation and yeah, they, they approached me at that point and saying, you know, you could do a lot of things. We'd kind of like you to do something, this kind of thing. And, and then during the pandemic where, you know, for a period of time, nothing was happening, even though I had, I was in post-production on a couple of movies, but I was just sitting around kind of bored. And I had thought about the M night scores before thinking they might be some version of them, some new exploration of them might be a good album because I felt that they are all connected in a funny way on mm. lots of ways. But um, I didn't want to just do a mashup. So I called Sony and I, and I said, rather than doing this, what I'd really like to do is this. And they got behind it in a big way. Um, and um, I just felt that it was something I had to do in a funny way. I mean, I didn't have any I'm trying to think I did have movie commitments waiting, but I wrote the, I wrote mm. the majority of it during the pandemic. Um, and just kind of to avoid being a mashup, I, I knew I had to write additional new material to get from one idea to the next. Mm. I didn't want it just to feel like, Oh, that cue into that cue into that cue. I really wanted each one of them to feel of a piece. Um, and I'm very, you know, quite honestly, um, it ended up, I don't think it's boastful to say this, but I was very happy with the way it ended up, um, kind of invested myself emotionally and financially, um, to the extent that I needed to, to get, get it to sound the way it sounds. I don't think it's boastful at all. I think it's just, I think that sixth sense cue lonely boy is that the lonely name boy, yeah that i'd always kind of just dug the cue that cut on the record is just i mean i don't even know what it's off the charts on every what level do you it's notice so as you're uh, speaking to robert's yeah. point what do you notice going back revisiting work that you've done maybe years ago i'm sure there's things that you've forgotten or things that you remember as slightly different than what you're hearing and but either way, you can learn from a lot of, you know, the experience since then or things you might have thought to yourself, I wish I had thought of that earlier. Or I wish I had done that differently. Do those things start to come up as you're revisiting these cues? What do you start to identify that maybe you didn't at the time when you're focused on a film? Well, <clears throat> quite honestly, pardon me, <clears throat> froggy this morning. Quite honestly, um, Knight and I worked so closely <clears throat> together. Um, <clears throat> you're going to edit this, right? Will you stop one sec? Or let me just clear my throat. <laughs> yeah. <clears> throat> yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> I'm getting old, Robert. <clears throat> no, you're not, man. That's one of the things I need to ask you, which is <laughs> if you are getting old and you're doing four mm. movies and solo records, then God, please share <laughs> your fountain of youth. You were saying you and Knight work closely. Yeah. So in the end, um, of course, any relationship with a director and a composer, the composer is ready to accept um, criticism and rejection from the director. Like I, I submitted many things to Knight that he very politely and collegially, collegially said, I don't think that's what, it, that's what works. And I remember one moment in Signs, I had written something and I was really so enthusiastic about it. <clears throat> and of course, I make very elaborate demos of all the work I do. And I sent it to Philadelphia where he was. And um, I got a call the next morning saying, James, you know, it's great, but it's just not working. And I, there was this pause and I, <laughs> and I, my word, my response was, <clears throat> That is profoundly disappointing. And I meant it, and he just started cracking up. And because it was so <laughs> overblown a response. I mean, you know, I'm used to doing now, this is earlier in my career, but I'm used to doing 30 or 40 rewrites of certain things occasionally, which is a horrendous thing. But in terms of feeling like I made mistakes or could have done something better, always. You know, always, I think I could go back and dig around and find, oh, that orchestration didn't work. And why did I do that again? But, you know, those those scores kind of came out uniquely 
correct in a funny way. It was they were more minimalist writing, much more minimalist, less um, <clears throat> embellishments, less orchestration, interior kind of um, stuff going on in the middle of the orchestra. And um, I think the mistake would have been to veer off course in writing about the tone of that those movies because that's what it's all about for me is hmm. every one of these bloody movies as you think you've done I, every kind of action movie and or every kind of and you haven't as soon as you get a new one um it's different and so i felt i didn't feel like i made any gross errors let me put it that way it's interesting you mentioned the tone because i actually wrote down a quote from an earlier podcast where uh first of all I use something that you said when I teach, <clears throat> which is you said, I'm trying to tell the same story that the director is trying to tell. And students, com young composers, it's like their jaw drops because they're there trying to impress the director with their super cool cue instead of, mm, right. he's going to be really impressed if you are on the same path that he is. Um, I mean, it was a great quote. You said, what was his or her intentions when the scene was shot? What is the character about? What are the threats to this relationship? I thought, you know, hey, com young composers, listen. But when you just said about the tone, you said, you can learn all the do's and don'ts of film scoring, but you really need to know what the music needs to feel like. And that's deep. I don't. Uh, well, it actually leads when when you go ahead. No, I was just going to say, um, I used to say that, and I've often said that about every every A list composer knows what the music is supposed to feel like, from <clears throat> Des Blatt to <clears throat> Hans or to Tommy Newman or certainly John. Um, I think that's intuitive. I think part of it, I don't think you can mm -hmm. really learn how to do that. I think one can learn more technique about the things not to do in terms of being early on a hit or, you know, things like that that are very kind of simple. Writing fewer notes usually helps, and I'm still struggle with that one. But <laughs> just in terms of how to, who's, you know, and I, I've also learned whose emotional point of view are we in in any given and I've missed that one many times where I've written a cue and the director will sit here and say, hmm, I don't think it's about what you've written. I think, I think you're blowing right wow. through something that's really important. And so I think I've become a much better listener and that helps. Um, Cause when I started, gosh, almost 40 years ago, um, I was quite arrogant. Head office. <laughs> Head office. Yeah. I was quite arrogant because, I don't know. I was good, relatively good pianist and I was a decent synthesist and it took me a while to stop being a diva, pain in the butt. Diva for no reason. I had no reason to be a diva because I hadn't succeeded, but I just came in here in, in, in the thing with a very kind of, I know what to do with your movie more than you know what to do with your movie. It's so much interesting stuff. I think, I identify when you said the diva part for me was I'm the musician. How could you know what's cool musically, director? I'm here to, and it never occurred to me, it's his house. I'm painting it. It was, hey, man, you hired me as a musician. You know, and there'd always be those directors who said, listen, I played trumpet in my high school band. I know music and you, oh, dude. But you said something earlier that I really love because the A-list composers, you, you kind of bifurcated it into those that know what it feels like and then there's those that understand the technique part, but the A-list is both. It's very easy maybe to sit on the sideline and say, I know what this scene needs. But what's always blown my mind about the A-list is they, you, can then musicalize that appropriately. That is, it's like sitting, saying, oh man, the guy should hit it into the outfield right now. That's what he should do. 
But how do you actually swing at a pitch and hit it there? That's a big stretch. You are unbelievable in the way you do that. Well, dude, you know what, Robert? You, you kind of crush it. I just want to say one thing. Go ahead. Um, I've had many, many opportunities to fail. So I've <laughs> had a lot of time in the saddle to learn. I may have a lot of good instincts, but it's instincts combined with experience, combined with technique that has really worked for me. Um, I like to think I've gotten better. And I've gotten better at some things. And I listen to older stuff in the 90s or whatever when I think, wow, I don't know if I could do that again. Because it was younger and more exuberant and just kind of out of huh. plain coloring out of the lines. And so I'm maybe a lot more thoughtful now. Sorry, what were you going to say, Matt? You know, we hear as as any kind of film score aficionado or fan knows like people like Bernard Her Bernard Herman stand out as kind of at least there's this kind of idea that they did their own thing you know and they and and we know that they pissed off directors as they went along and they you know they they had certain relationships that I think suffered as a result of their approach to those but given that this is such a hugely collaborative art form I'm curious whether you think the state of kind of a good story requires a director and composer to be simpatico now, or if, you know, there's ever a point where there's such a brilliant, you know, musical idea that, you know, it's worth risking that relationship and what the director who should know the story better than anybody else um, thinks about it and all like something that's, that's worth going nuclear over no you're wrong here's that this is the vision i don't know if that's ever happened to you in particular but um that's kind of the difference between the strong-headed composer and maybe the one that has learned to get along uh as uh as you've made more and more things what are your kind of thoughts on that well <clears throat> i think i am pretty strong-headed composer but that doesn't mean i'm going to lock horns and, and go you know nuclear mm. as you say with the director um I will defend my point of view in a sort of collaborative mm. way. Um, and then I have to just take a deep breath. And if it's still not working, um, muster up the energy and the, the actual physical energy to do it all over again, which is hard. Um, but as you mm. go, as you go through this marathon of writing a long score, say, um, it becomes very physical. And so it, to lose um, an opportunity for a, a particularly great cue that you think is a great cue to succeed is hurtful. And I find that a lot of the times where I have a personal revelation in my own work that, oh, wow, the mm -hmm. counterpoint, I really did good counterpoint there. That woodwind orchestration is really cool. And almost inevitably, every time I have a personal revelation, that gets red flagged by the director because it sounds like doesn't sound like anything I've done before. And um, yeah, that's just kind of, that's <laughs> another reason to do a solo album. Um, no notes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. But as far as I the bet. director, I mean, yeah, it is his or her show. Absolutely. And it took me a while to learn that. And I've, I say to young composers that one of the things you have to do to succeed is feel sorry for the director. And I, oh, nice. I do that, you know, because unless they're, and even though I want to kill them sometimes, not kill them, but assault them physically, yeah. say, um, yep. I get over that quickly and I remind myself they're, they're carrying such a huge burden, giant bunch of money spent testing, eh, not so good, running out of more opportunities to change the movie. Um, so they come to us in the last last stretch and really some people refer to it as the final rewrite and i think that that's really accurate mm -hmm. um and we yeah. have an opportunity to help the film or ruin the film that can happen <laughs> or write a great score to what turns out to be a mediocre movie that happens it's hard to make a good movie um but i do think yes i think for those great cinematic moments i think do think the composer and the director have to be pretty much in sync now sometimes those relationships burn out that's okay but 
they go on for mm. quite a while, hopefully. I'm actually surprised you said that thing to night. You know, I'm deeply disappointed simply because I, I can only imagine you're you might be tired and burned out at that point too. I mean, the the director by the time he gets to the music and the final thing, I always saw in my gig, they were exhausted, <laughs> they were angry, mm -hmm. they were out of money. Mm -hmm. The studio was just relentlessly hammering their well being. And the composer relationship was the potential for little bit of solace and man can we hang together and just do music and i'm so burnt out on this movie studio and this movie so it's such a precious and fragile time but i always thought he said you know i'm deeply disappointed a-listers <coughs> like yourself also mm -hmm. i was always amazed by your political savvy i sat next to the big guns who the director would say, I don't know if that's working. And I think oh, that's the coolest cue in your movie. <laughs> what do you mean? That's not working. And I'd bite my tongue and the composer would say, you would say, huh, tell me what's not working for you. And I'd want to hug you to say, how did you just do that? How were you not just saying I'm deeply disappointed? That was big. Yeah, and is your blood pressure, you know, a million? Yeah. In those moments? How do you do it? <laughs> oh, I've said that, you know, I've said, are you, you know, I wouldn't say, are you kidding? But uh, <laughs> you're thinking it. I have <laughs> been thinking that. And then, you know, sure enough, going back and doing it again, more often than not, produces something that I can like even more. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes not. And that certainly happens. Um, uh, yeah, but I, in the end, I just don't get, allow myself to get, steamed about it anymore yeah i'm very thick-skinned and you have to be that's so great and the thing about a compo about the, a composer or a director reaching the end of the line on a movie that's not working for whatever reasons out of assets and out of resources um is that i find um i find the it just drives me more and i feel i t i like being the mm. white knight I like being the hero to mm. save this $200 million movie. Everything's on the line. It's going to be a worldwide huge movie or not and blah, blah. And they come to me. So that is a big ego deal maybe, but it works because um, I just like taking on the responsibility. I like sitting in the hot seat. I think um, having a limit, a time limit, and having those kinds of pressures is something one either responds well to or sort of collapses and folds. But I've always been pretty good. You know, that. that's, that is Bo Buddhism 101 <laughs> in this way. I wanted to ask, what do you do when a movie's not working and how do you stay positive and not whisper to yourself or to your family, oh, you know, it's a, all those expressions, you know, I'm polishing a, you know what, and I'm, you just kind of answered it, which is you're rising to the occasion. I've never thought that. I always thought composers had to kind of go home and gnash their teeth. And they're the people on the 405 freeway saying, oh my God, I gotta finish Can't believe they saddled me shit. with this. Yeah. Right. Right. So you just actually gave me a whole new perspective I never thought of, which is you're going to be mm -hmm. super positive. Well, sort of. If you were a fly on the wall <laughs> okay, in, my, in my control room, you'd hear me complaining bitterly about <laughs> a movie. Or um, the thing is, in order to complete the task, I think one has to believe that maybe the movie's better than I think it is. Hmm. Um, and that okay. actually even go beyond that. Say, wow, this movie is, I think it's, and I would always ask Michael or I'd ask Xander, whoever was, very close to me as, as an assistant. Um, do you think this movie is really bad or do you think it's pretty good? And we all, we <laughs> all kind of say, Oh, we, we, th we think it's, will they be honest? Of course. Um, I guess <laughs> they, they are protective of me to some extent. They don't want to blow me out, but, uh, yeah, they're pretty honest. They're pretty honest. And yeah, 
I think you just have to find something ask you that about, inspires you in the movie. Find one character. Well, you know, that's that the stuff. Jerry Goldsmith phrase that I always loved, which is he says, you're scoring the movie you want it to be. I like that. Which is, you know, not the one that's on screen. I did a, I was blessed with the opportunity to do a movie with him that was a, a wreck of a movie. Nobody was getting along. Story wasn't working. The lead character had a beard and the studio was infuriated by that. He wanted, you know, and Jerry was hearing all this stuff and score was magnificent and he over compensated in so many ways and i just he said i'm scoring the movie i want this to be that's the script i initially read that i signed on for and uh, god bless you i wanted to ask you about your assistance and i may be one of them is sitting nearby and listening he's right but there you have had a oh good okay michael close your ears um you've had a pretty great run of assistance blowing up to be great kind of on their way composers. I mean, I, I was recently somewhere where Chris Bacon was getting awards and I remember meeting him making tea, maybe for you and me. And, uh, I'd just be curious to know, is there a, besides just your good instinct, is there a process for becoming an assistant at the James Newton Howard studio or are the, is it just, dumb luck of somebody stumbling into that room we will be starting michael a contest the gig? uh you'll be getting yes. a lot of submissions <laughs> well how did michael xander <laughs> and chris get the unbelievable gig of being in the room with you you know uh one of the things i think that is important to understand about working with me is that it's incredibly intimate and small you know i have mm -hmm. two technical slash creative assistants. Michael is the head guy. Um, we just hired a new guy because the, who was it that left? I can't remember. I can't remember. Anyway, um, and I think the process goes like this. I have stolen people um, from <laughs> remote or somewhere else um, a couple of times. I think I stole Michael from remote sort of right or anywhere somewhere nice and um so the word gets out in a very small com community that that i'm looking for an assistant and i don't know i think maybe we even put an ad out in a couple of things is that possible michael did i ever put ads oh are you okay. anonymously. anonymously not james newton howard it might say a list composer looking for assistant needs to be uh very good at the following thing, da, 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 da. Um, please, please apply to whatever. <laughs> and then uh, we get like 50 people come in or 60 people come in right back. And then Michael and Aldo would do the, or previously Xander or whoever else is here would do the initial interviews with them. And they'll single out a bunch of people that they think I might get along with and they think are hmm. technically up to speed. And this also, this process also Good. includes Pamela Solly, my 17 year personal assistant. I know Pamela. Yep. Um, and then there's another level and then there's another level. And the last level usually comes down to about three or four people. And then I sit in a room with them hmm. and I just feel the vibe. Yeah. That's all it is. I feel like, Am I going to be comfortable writing bad music in front of this guy? Because I do write bad music. Oh, damn. Um, or That's girl. So I've had a lot of female assistants, by the way. Yeah. Before we let you go, any thoughts? Matt and I were talking about this, how we should ask James. Matt, you had that question well, you wanted to ask first, about. First, I, I want to just touch on the evolution. Yeah. I, th there's a couple trends that I've seen, but, um, but this actually ties into a project that is releasing now hunger games this being a prequel so i guess it's not quite an a direct evolution of the story it's it comes before the existing story but i i was curious with hunger games how you approached what the music needed given that it feeds into um a storyline that so many millions of people are familiar with now and what that 
either allowed you to do or or you had to kind of restrain certain things going into it. Um, the, the movie's out uh, coming out uh, this week, so I haven't seen it yet in all all uh, all transparency. But I was curious about your kind of approach to that. Um, that's a good question, because initially it is a prequel. You're right. Um, it takes place 65 or 64 years. I'm not, I don't know exactly the number before Katniss is born, I guess, comes into the picture. Hmm. Um, so it's mm-hmm. all new characters, um, except for one, of course. It's the origin story of Snow. And what's his first name? I can't remember in the movie. Sorry, but I'm getting... Coriolanus? Who? Coriolanus <laughs> no, Snow? No, Coriolanus, right. But that's the... is Oh, right. So anyway, I'm getting old, right? I forget names. The bad guy. The, 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 the future bad, bad guy. guy. Yeah. And um, the origin, I guess, of the Hunger Games and what they were all for and what they were about. And initially, my mandate from Francis was just keep this in the world of the Hunger Games. Feel free to use as many themes as you want. Use whatever you want. And I Mm. said, okay. And then I saw the movie and I realized can't use a whole lot of anything that I've already written because it's a completely different movie. It's a completely different sensibility. Um, hmm. It's very substantive. It deals with a lot of intense issues about betrayal and about friendship and about love and about hate. And it's kind of more of an adult movie in a funny way. So I, and then the next mandate I got was don't use any electronics. So the score mm. is purely orchestral, which I loved. And the rhythms, of course, there's some drums and things in there where, where I think they need to be and where Francis had put them in. But I, it was an opportunity to color this movie very differently. So I used a lot more woodwinds, kind of scary, creepy, low winds. Um, I always use a lot of choir. Uh, my wife thinks I use too much boys choir, mm. but I still like it. Um, it was just a completely new movie and a new musical opportunity. So yes, I do quote some themes, um, but not a lot. Um, Why no electronics? Do you think Francis said or, or minimal? Any just aesthetically? I think he was. I think they were thinking since this is there's no specific time for these movies really laid out to begin with, but. Mm. This is earlier and maybe sub sub um, subversively, we can just make it feel older without the contemporary element of. You That's know, what I was a, wondering. Yeah, Almost like it good, hasn't been, hasn't been, cre- yet. hasn't been invented yet. Right. Oh, that's interesting. Exactly. Yeah. I'm now wondering when you did water for elephants with Francis, had he, were either of you aware that you were about to embark on this ginormous collaboration and franchise. I think it was pretty significantly before uh, the first Hunger Games, but I think you had worked with him once before Water for Elephant. Uh, I am legend. Um, I am legend, right. Because he, he he's basically in the first conversation said, what do you think of James Newton Howard? I, I said, who? He... <laughs> I said, um, with good reason. Yes. Where do we sign? You know, and you know how much I love Water for Elephants and love that score oh, and too. love those I, cues. I Just love, love the them. movie. The oh, so good. Um, Same. well, you know, so good. Just quickly, um, the first one, Hunger Games, I turned down because I'd never heard of it. And I didn't know. My then, uh, 12 year old son said, Dad, are you crazy? It's the Hunger Games. It's just amazing. Perfect. So Gary Ross directed the very first one. And Gary had called me. Wow. um, And I said, you know, I have to, with all due respect, pass. I I don't think it's right for me. And then some other people got involved with it composing-wise, and he offered it to me again. And by then I had kind of knew what it was about and then screened the movie for me. And uh, I was all in. Um, and I think we had a relatively short amount of time to do it. And then Francis took over. And Francis is just one of the best people on earth that I, for me to work with. Gets it. 
yeah. gets it and has such specific and helpful notes. And it's just wonderful. It's just friendly and fun. And, and the, it was like ticking all the boxes from the sec, you know, the catching fire all the way through. And it made the whole process. It was testing well, you know, all those things that can be goblins, you know, that can really make things tricky. So, um, yeah, I guess I can't remember quite what you're asking, but uh, Francis was. Yeah, oh no, it's just. That's so nice. I thought I was mistaken. I thought Francis did all of them. I'd forgotten that he wasn't the first. I remember, I think Gary Ross was Sea Biscuit, which was mm-hmm. didn't work out so well. Well, well um, the movie I, you that brought he up wrote department. that was really good, Dave. And Gary wrote. Oh, that's right. That. That's what it was, Dave. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, really great. Sorry. Really. You you brought up great. that um that synthetic uh score maybe not being invented yet in this whatever timeline we're in in the the Hunger Games world. That's actually where uh I mentioned to Robert I wanted to ask you the trends that evolve. I remember watching. I can't remember what the film was. One of your early earlier films, and see it, that had a lot of synth in it. And thinking, man, this is cool again, because <laughs> there is a period where some of those sounds really go out of date. And now a lot of those have started to kind of reemerge. And um, some of them are almost exactly the same thing. You would expect them to evolve a little bit, but some of them have almost become timeless. I'm curious, and I realize this is all biased by your perspective and kind of your your uh, work and who you've worked with. How, what trends you see moving forward? Um kind of emotionally in the way that music, like the sentiment that is brought by uh, musical accompaniment in storytelling? I mean, I think that's a good question. And I, th- I believe that the opportunities to write big romantic adventures with a hundred piece orchestra are few and far between. And I love doing mm. that. Um, mm. But I also love doing electronic scores um, in my own way. I'm not, I'm not on the level of Atticus and Trent. Um, I think they, well, I'll, yeah, I mean, they do their own thing and it's kind of incomparable in a lot of ways because that's just what they do. <laughs> but I think there are a number of young composers who come up with that, um, aesthetic that it's about minimalist writing, almost sound design, which I think is really important. Mm-hmm. And, I think the synth thing has evolved in a big way to where it's it's just an acceptable part of the palette. It's just natural. It's just going to be in there. I think some people do it more, combine it with orchestra more successfully than others. I think I've always been good at that Mm. because I started off, you know, I I learned to write. I worked with Elton John back in the middle seventies and Elton gave me the opportunity to do synthesizer work and uh, work with an orchestra. Um, So I think that was, kind of a natural place for me to go. But I think synthesizers, again, who's who's programming, what notes are they playing? Yeah. When do they play it? Can be heartbreaking. Absolutely. Can be very emotional. I think that it's evolved so organically, which is a weird word about synthesizers, that now it's just the music that fits the film. Yes. And I mean I, and the cool yeah. thing is it can kind of be anything. The synth world is so manipulatable in terms of its character that yes. um because people associate all of these kind of orchestral instruments with certain feelings and of course it's way that's super simplifying it but um but some of those associations don't really exist yet with the synth world and so you're maybe not quite fighting against the current when you hear you know i can't use this because it's the violins are too sad or whatever those types of things maybe those rules don't quite exist yet and that kind of new world of it is still pretty, uh, pretty interesting, even though it, you're, you're right. It has been around a while. It has solidified itself. You know, you- and I think you articulated the sound design part of it is also super interesting. Now people sampling the sound of a garage door closing and making that a cue. You know, I have to admit and that a lot of one. my palette for synths and one of the great ways that Michael and others before Michael have helped me is by providing me, and this is a rich guy. I get to, because I'm, you know, very successful and I I have the, I guess I can afford to have somebody, Hey, bring me a thousand new synth sounds. 
And Michael is incredibly mm. good at that. And then I'm good with, once I get a sound, I can manipulate it. You know, I work in Ableton and blah, 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 to some extent. Um, but I have to say most of the programming um, does not come from me anymore. I, I've chosen to spend my time really on dealing with finishing the score or whatever, but. Um, yeah, I think that your um, day job is not only finishing the score, but composing it and Ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to be next to the maestro this morning. This has been so much His fun. Day job. Thank you, James. Yeah, yeah oh, thanks man. for your time as always. James, I, 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 ha I haven't geeked out, but you know I've always, just always loved your, you and your musical sensibility is about as close to what I would dream of if I was a director, getting James Newton Howard to come and be that emotional. That kind of and cool, cool stuff. And we're fortunate because this Always month cool. is James Newton Howard it month. It is James. It might be James Newton Howard <laughs> really day. Is, I, think, I think one afternoon would be enough. That oh, would, that's funny. Um, thank you, Robert, for that. And um, of course, Matt, it's a pleasure talking to you guys. And continued success. JNH. Okay. Big love. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate your good wishes. Thanks, James. Okay. Bye.